Jet engines are attached to most modern aircraft that we use to transport people all over the world, so they must be pretty good. How do they work though? Let's find out, shall we? Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the fifth class in the AGK series. Today we're going to be taking a look at jet engines. In this first class on jet engines, we're just going to have a little overview of how a jet engine works and the fundamental principles that drive the things through the air. And in the next class, we'll take a look at the individual components that make up the jet engine and get into a little bit more detail. Jet engines work because of Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction force. And it also has a bit of Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. So what we do is we send air out of the back of the engine really, really fast, and the equal and opposite reaction force pushes the engine and our aircraft through the air. The amount of thrust produced by the engine depends on two things, the mass of the air that is being accelerated and the level that it is being accelerated. So we can either accelerate a lot of air a small amount, or we can accelerate a small amount of air a lot and increase its speed a lot. In reality, a jet engine will do a bit of both. It's not gonna rely solely on one or the other. So this is what the equation looks like. We got our thrust, which is a force, equals the mass of the air times the difference in speed, which is the acceleration, F equals ma. The change in speed is the exhaust gas speed and the inlet speed to the engine, the difference between the two. And the inlet speed to the engine is the same as the aircraft's forward speed. This isn't the whole picture though. For the jet engine, we must add on some more bits to this equation. When air exits the nozzle at the back of the engine, it has a higher pressure than the surrounding air, which creates a force. If we think about what pressure is, it is a certain amount of force applied to an area. You've got pressure equals force over area. If we want to find out the force or the thrust, we want to then multiply the pressure by the area. That area is the output nozzle of the jet engine at the back of it. So we've got to add on another bit to our equation to find out the force that we get from this pressure differential. So we get the area of the nozzle multiplied by the difference in pressure between the surrounding air and the output pressure of that nozzle to give us our whole equation for thrust out of a jet engine, which is the mass of the air times the acceleration of that air, plus the area of the nozzle multiplied by the difference in pressure between the output pressure of the nozzle and the surrounding air. All right, so that's how thrust is expressed in an equation, but how does the thing actually work? Well, it's essentially the same as a piston engine, except that cycle of suck, squeeze, bang, blow is happening consistently and constantly and isn't broken up into different stages but it's broken up into different sections of the engine instead. The first stage of that cycle is the suck or inlet stage, and that is what happens at the intake of the engine. Air is sucked in at the intake, and the air will be sucked in at the same speed as the aircraft's forward speed. After the air is sucked in, it is squeezed via a multi-stage compressor. We'll look at these individual components of the engine in more detail in the next class, but basically a compressor is a rotating disc with lots of small fan blades that draw air through them and squeeze the air slightly uh, onto the next stage of the compressor, which will do a bit more and a bit more and so on. As the pressure of the air rises, a pressure differential would be formed, whereby the pressure in the compressor would be higher than the pressure of the air that's coming in. This isn't good, as air always flows from high pressure areas to low pressure areas, but we want to, the air to flow this way, not this way. So that pressure differential is like a fundamental thing of wind generation in meteorology. But for AGK and jet engines, this would basically cause the air to flow the wrong way through the engine. So we don't want that. And we counteract that by creating a convergent duct. We do this by either increasing the diameter of the compressor or we can reduce the diameter of the surround. A convergent duct, according to Bernoulli's theory, means that the air must flow faster, and the convergent duct is precisely calculated and designed to counteract the air flow that could be caused by that pressure differential that is formed by the compressing of that air. It's very clever stuff, this. 
after the air has been compressed, fuel is added to the air in the combustion chamber. The combustion chamber is continuous and it takes place at approximately constant pressure. This is because the temperature and volume of the gas rise a lot, meaning that when we look at the combined gas law, the pressure can remain approximately constant as long as the temperature and the volume increase by enough to counteract it. And that's what we're playing with here. We're wanting the pressure to remain constant, but the volume and the temperature to rise a lot to therefore drive this engine in the next stages. The large volume of expanding gas can be directed out the back of the engine to send us forward, essentially. So at the back of the combustion chamber, the expanding gas is funneled through a converging duct, just a very slight one. And this converging duct rapidly increases the speed of the airflow or the gas flow. This is Bernoulli and the conservation of mass flow rate at play again. Before the air exits out the back of the engine for propulsion, a turbine section is used which powers the compressor via a shaft. It's almost like a windmill or a watermill, but a very advanced version of one. The gas passes over the turbine and exerts a pressure and a force onto these blades, which turn them. This causes the pressure to drop slightly and to keep the combined gas law happy, that means that the temperature drops and the velocity of the gas drops a bit as well. Basically what we're doing is we're using some of the energy of that output flow of gas to turn the blades and those blades on the turbine go through a shaft and run the compressor at the intake of this engine. So we're using the exhaust to power the compressor and the compressor powers the combustion chamber which powers the turbine. It's all very cyclical and that runs off that and that runs off that. It's very clever. After the turbine stage, the gases are fed through a slightly convergent duct in order to accelerate the gas back up to a rapid speed and that air flowing out the back of the engine propels this engine and the aircraft forwards through the air. Efficiency and thrust generation is key to making these engines worth it. We want to maximize the amount of thrust we can get from the engine. And maximizing the thrust is just manipulating this equation. Hopefully you can see that the faster the engine spins, the more air gets compressed and therefore we can fit more of that compressed air through the engine every second. Therefore, the mass that would be accelerated through the engine and therefore the thrust would increase. That's the most basic way to increase thrust and that is what you do when you put the thrust lever forward. You're making the engine spin faster and that means more air is compressed, we can fit more in and we get more thrust as a result. So what else can we do to maximize this equation? Well, we can make sure the change of the speed of the air is maximized. This can happen when we are stationary at takeoff. If we have the brakes set and set full power, max RPMs, then the difference in speeds of forward air and the air coming out the back of the engine are gonna be very large. This means that we can generate a large amount of thrust for takeoff, which is very good, but sometimes we don't need all that thrust and we can basically cap it off at a certain level. This is called derating, which we'll look at a bit more in the next class. A big part of this equation is the mass of air that we are accelerating. Therefore, the air that we are accelerating has a big influence on the thrust produced. It basically comes down to the density of that air, the environmental conditions that we are within. If the same volume of air has fewer molecules in it, then the mass of air going through the engine is going to be lower, and according to the equation, that makes us produce less thrust. Things that influence the density of the air negatively, aka make it less dense, are high temperatures, high altitudes, and high humidity levels. When traveling at high speeds, air compresses on its own as it comes into contact with the inlet of the engine and the compressor, which means that the compressor can compress it even more than the normal low speed air, making more massive air travel through the engine. And this means a better burn in the combustion chamber and more thrust up to a certain limit within the, uh, basically a temperature limit within the combustion chamber so we can use the compressibility of the air to our benefit. We can also ensure the area of the nozzle and output of the hot air out the back of the engine is as large as it can be to maximize this second part of the engine here. That's part of the reason a bigger jet engine will create more thrust, as well as being able to squeeze a larger mass of air through the engine every second. There's also a couple of ancillary systems, which we will cover in a couple classes time, 
that run off of the jet engines. They basically draw air away from the engine, from within it, and this reduces the mass flow through the engine, which therefore will reduce the thrust. Engine anti-icing systems can also heat up the air before it enters the engine, which, as we've learned about when we're talking about environmental conditions, will make the air less dense, means that there's less mass flowing through, and therefore the engine produces less thrust. So switching off all these ancillary systems as well will help to maximize our thrust output. So far, we have looked at a basic single spool turbojet engine. There are a few different variants of jet engines though. The problem with this single spool design is that it isn't very efficient at low speeds or even really in the normal speeds that an airliner would fly at. So a variant using two different rotational spools was invented called the twin spool bypass engine. In a twin spool bypass engine, a smaller acceleration is given to a larger mass of air in one part of the engine, and then in the other part of the engine, the core of the engine, we still provide a high acceleration to a small amount of air, a small mass of air. To work most efficiently, the air that is bypassing the engine is only accelerated a small amount, but there's a large mass of it. This means we have two streams of air that need to be treated slightly differently. We have the low pressure air that bypasses the core, and that's accelerated by the low pressure compressor. This needs to rotate slower than the high pressure compressor that affects the air that goes through the core. I'll explain this in more detail in the next class, but for now, all we need to know is that the slower rotation is achieved by using two spools, basically contained one inside of the other, and two turbines to drive those different spools at different speeds, those different shafts at different speeds. The high pressure turbine is located right after the combustion chamber to use the full advantage of the high velocity air, and the low pressure turbine is located after this turbine once some of the energy is taken out of the air and the air is flowing slightly slower, which facilitates the slower rotation required by the low pressure compressor which sends all that air around the core of the engine rather than through the core of the engine. The bypassing airstream has secondary advantages as well. The accelerating low pressure air isn't heated up, reducing the temperatures and wear and tear caused by the compressing of air. The bypass air isn't accelerated as much, meaning that this engine is more efficient at low speeds. And because the total thrust is made up of the bypassing air and the core air, the core air can be reduced in size, or sorry, the core section can be reduced in size, which reduces weight, and the bypassing air surrounds the core and shrouds the core of the high velocity air at the back of the engine, which has a very good noise dampening effect, which is good for busy airports and airports near cities. The next evolution of engine is this triple spool bypass engine. As the name suggests, there are three different spools. In this engine, we add an intermediate pressure stage rather than just the low pressure and the high pressure stage. And this means that each compressor and turbine can operate at just the right speed to get the most efficient use out of the air that is traveling through that part of the engine. <laughs> turbo shafts and turbo props are a variant of the concept of a jet engine, where instead of using the air acceleration out the back to propel the aircraft forward, the engine is attached to a shaft which drives a gearbox um, and that gearbox is then connected to a propeller for a turbo prop or that turbo shaft is connected to a uh, rotor of a helicopter. The advantage of using this sort of engine is that propellers are quite efficient at low speeds. So you can get the advantage of using a propeller or a helicopter rotor at low speeds with the advantage that a jet engine brings. And the big advantage that a jet engine brings is mainly that that power to weight ratio of a jet engine is much greater than a traditional cylinder, petrol or diesel based engine. The downside of this is that jet based engines are more expensive, basically because of all that clever engineering and precise manufacturing of all those ducts and uh, fan blades and stuff within the engine. So you won't really see a turbo prop or a turbo shaft on a standard general aviation small aircraft all that often. 
So a quick summary then, this is how an engine works. It sucks air through the inlet, the air travels into the inlet at the same forward speed as the aircraft is traveling. It then gets squeezed within the compressor, increasing the pressure and temperature of that air. That air is then delivered into the combustion chamber where fuel is added and a spark sets the whole process going. That engine, uh, sorry, that fuel and air mixture burns. It is then funneled out towards the turbine. Um, we use the expansion of the volume of the air primarily to make it flow in the right direction. We expand it over these turbine blades, which rotate and drive the compressor via this shaft down the middle. And that air is still uh, expanding in volume. And as it expands in volume, we duct it and direct it towards the back of the engine sending it out the back of the engine to make us go forward. It all comes down to this equation though. The thrust equals the mass of the air accelerated times the acceleration of that air, the change in speed between this air and this air. And we also add on um, the pressure side of things. So the air coming out of here is quite high pressure compared to the surroundings. And we've got to multiply it by the area that that air is flowing out of to get an extra bit for our equation. To maximize our thrust output, we want to basically manipulate these figures here. We want to increase the mass of air going through. We can do that with a larger engine, or we can do that by um, flying in high density air. High density air would be things that's like cold air, low down air, uh, very dry air is quite dense. Things that would be bad for this would be high altitude, the air becomes less dense, high temperature, air spreads out, and uh, in high humidity places as well, basically the oxygen is replaced by water and that makes the air less dense as a result. We also want to avoid the use of any extra ancillary systems. They normally draw air from the compressor stages in order to drive things like uh, the air conditioning and there's a few other systems that run off of the, the air that goes through the engine, we want to switch all them off and that will maximise our thrust output. We also get a few variants of this engine, this is a sing simple single spool jet engine. You can get double spools or twin spool engines which will have a large fan at the front and air will bypass this central core section and we're basically accelerating a larger amount of air, we're maximising the mass of air, but we're just going to accelerate a little bit in the low pressure stage and then we'll still have a high pressure stage, which looks a bit more like this thing I've just drawn here. And we're gonna accelerate a smaller mass of air, a large amount, and when combined, we're gonna get a nice uh, large output thrust with a few additional benefits, such as being able to reduce the size of this core section and the slower, lower accelerating air shrouds the higher accelerating air and has quite a good noise dampening effect. The next evolution of that is a triple spool, high bypass engine, which is the same thing, but you have more optimized stages of uh, compression and turbine and acceleration of air. You'll get low pressure, intermediate pressure and high pressure, whereas in a twin spool you'd only get a low pressure and a high pressure section. You also have turbo props and turbo fans. Turbo props and, uh, not turbo fans, sorry, turbo props and turbo shafts. Turbo props are good because it gives you the advantages of a propeller at low speeds, but also gives you the advantage of a high power to weight ratio um, that you get from jet engines. Same thing goes for the turbo shafts, which power helicopter rotors. The disadvantage obviously is that these engines are expensive. All these clever ducts and components have to be very highly manufactured and designed uh, and optimized to work for that specific jet engine. It's very complicated to design one of these things. You need to be very exact and they're very expensive. I don't know how much engines are, but there's no way you're gonna be able to afford one for a small aircraft. Um, and that's a basic overview of jet engines. In the next class, we'll break down the components a bit more and explain why a low pressure compressor needs to run slightly slower than a high pressure compressor and things like that. We'll dive into it in a little bit more detail in each individual section.